if you practice AP macroeconomic free response questions together, I'm going to be giving some tips and advice on how to answer these types of questions, and we're going to solve them together in this video. The first thing you need to know about the AP macroeconomics free response section of the exam is that there are always three questions included. Question one is always what we refer to as the long FRQ. On a real AP exam, you should spend approximately 25 minutes answering question one in the FRQ section. We're going to answer this question in much less than 25 minutes today, so you can pause it and rewind as you need to to hear explanations for each of the questions in this free response question. Let's begin with number one, part A. Assume that the economy of country Z is operating on the upward sloping portion of its short run aggregate supply curve. Assume that the government increases spending. Before I even begin answering part A to this question, I'm going to go ahead and sketch an aggregate demand aggregate supply diagram. This is helpful to me. Even though the question doesn't require me to do so, I'm going to draw one because it will help me answer the question and come up with the correct responses to this question. So ADAS, as we know, includes the price level and the real GDP on its two axes. We have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve and an upward sloping aggregate supply curve. But as implied in this question, there are actually different ranges to the aggregate supply curve. The short run aggregate supply curve includes a horizontal range below full employment, an upward sloping range around full employment, and a vertical range beyond full employment. So we can call the short run aggregate supply. So we're assuming that this economy begins in the upward sloping range of its aggregate supply curve. An assumption we could safely make is that this economy is producing somewhere near its full employment level and has an equilibrium price level that corresponds with that. So let's go back to the question. How will the increase in government expenditures affect each of the following in the short run? We know that aggregate demand is made up of four different types of expenditures. Consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, and net exports, which includes exports minus imports. An increase in government spending, as the question describes, leads to, therefore, an increase in aggregate demand. So we'll go ahead and shift our aggregate demand curve outward to AD1. Now we can answer the question. For part I, we must indicate how the increase in government spending affects aggregate demand. Well, as we can see in our graph, aggregate demand increases. We should probably assume that this is only a one-point question. The reason is it asks how will the increase in expenditures affect aggregate demand. It does not say to explain how the increase in expenditures affects aggregate demand. Therefore, a question like this would most likely be only one point. And I can get that one point by indicating, as I have done here, that aggregate demand will increase. No more information is needed to get one point on this question. So let's look at part II to A. In part II, we are asked to indicate how aggregate supply will be affected. In fact, as we can see on the graph, an increase in expenditures leads to an increase in aggregate demand, an increase in real GDP, and an increase in the price level. However, one thing that does not change is aggregate supply. There is no shift in the aggregate supply curve resulting from this increase in expenditures. So as far as aggregate supply goes, we can say that there is no change in short run aggregate supply. This, of course, will also be a one-point question, and no further information is needed to earn one point on this question. So there we have our answer to part A. There is an increase in aggregate demand resulting from the increase in government expenditures, but no change in short-run aggregate supply. Let's move on to part B of this question. Part B says, using a correctly labeled graph of the aggregate demand and aggregate supply, show the effect of the increase in government expenditures on real output and the price level. Well, fortunately, we've already done this. So you can see in our graph here, I'll put a little B next to that so that the examiner knows that this is my graph for part B. We have shown that aggregate demand increases, the average price level increases, and real output increases. So now we can move on to part C. Part C says, assume that the government funded this increase in expenditure by borrowing from the public. Using a correctly labeled graph of the loanable funds market, show the effect of this increase in government borrowing on the real interest rate. So now we have the chance to draw another diagram. This one, the loanable funds diagram, is a very commonly asked about diagram on the 
macro FRQ section. So let's look at our labels in this graph. The loanable funds diagram, actually it already tells us what the vertical axis will be labeled, shows the real interest rate. So I'm going to call it IR with the little r for real. And the horizontal axis, of course this is the loanable funds market, so it shows the quantity of loanable funds. Now what is the loanable funds market? As I've explained in a previous lesson in which this market is introduced, the loanable funds market shows the supply of loanable funds, which represents the amount of savings in the nation's private banks, and the demand for loanable funds, which shows the demand for investment from the private sector, investment in capital and investment in new homes by households. Now how does an increase in the government's budget deficit affect this market? There are a couple of ways to illustrate this, but today I'm going to illustrate it in the simplest way possible. So the deficit leads to, and that's what this little arrow means here, an increase in the interest rate on government bonds. Now why is this the case? Well, bonds are how governments borrow money. If governments need to borrow money to pay for a budget deficit, they must raise the interest rate on those bonds to make them more attractive to investors. But as the interest rate on government bonds increases, fewer people will be willing to save their money in the private banking system. Now that's what our loanable funds diagram shows. So what happens is that the supply of loanable funds decreases. Households will wish to buy government bonds rather than saving their money in banks. So let's put our original equilibrium interest rate on our graph. We'll call that IRE. And our original quantity of funds demanded for investment, we'll call that QLF. E. The increase in interest rate on government bonds attracts savers towards government bonds and away from the private market for loanable funds, reducing the supply of loanable funds available to the private sector, to SLF1. Now, as we can see, there is going to be a higher equilibrium interest rate, we'll call that IR1, and a lower quantity of funds demanded for private investment, we'll call that QLF1. So, ultimately, the government's increased budget deficit leads to higher real interest rates in the market for loanable funds. And we have answered this question completely. This is most likely a three-point question. Two points for the graph being labeled correctly and drawn correctly. One point for showing the correct change in the interest rate. Now there is another way to illustrate the crowding out effect as this is known, and that is by drawing an increase in the demand for loanable funds. However, that will be that has been explained in an earlier video lecture, and I will not show how that is illustrated today. Okay, let's move on to Part D now. Part D says, given the change in the real interest rate in Part C, what will be the effect on each of the following in the foreign exchange market? The supply of country Z's currency and the value of country Z's currency. Now, I can tell you right now that these questions are most likely worth two points for I and one point for II. The reason is I asks for an explanation, but II does not. So this is another one that does not require a graph, but I'm going to draw one anyway. Let's draw a, a graph showing the foreign exchange market for country Z's currency. Now, in any foreign exchange market diagram, you can label the vertical axis exchange rate, ER, and the quantity of the currency, I'm going to call this currency the dollar. The demand for the country's currency is downward sloping, the supply of the country's currency is upward sloping, and the equilibrium exchange rate is at the intersection of supply and demand. I'll call that ERE, and the quantity of dollars in this case is QE. Now what happens that could affect the market for this country's currency on the foreign exchange markets? Let's look at the question again. Given the change in the real interest rate in Part C, well in Part C we saw that the real interest rate increased. What will be the effect on the foreign exchange market? Higher interest rates will lead to an increase in demand for investment, and when we say investment here we're referring to financial investment or the flow of capital into country Z. So one thing that could happen is that the demand for country Z's currency, the dollar, will increase but another thing that will happen is that the supply available in foreign economies, in foreign exchange markets, will decrease. Why is that? If you are a saver in country Z, and you can either save your money in country Z, or in another country, 
and the interest rate on savings in countries Z increases, you will be less willing to supply your dollar to foreign exchange markets because you will be less willing to save your money abroad. In other words, you will keep your financial capital within your own economy. So what we should see happen is the supply of country Z's currency should decrease. Again, fewer people will wish to save their money abroad now that interest rates are higher in country Z. This should cause the exchange rate to increase and the quantity demanded abroad to decrease. So there's our graph, even though it didn't ask for one. But the result, the outcome will be a decrease in the supply of country Z's currency in foreign exchange markets, and therefore country Z's currency will appreciate. So for I, I can say the supply decreases because country Z's residents are less willing to save abroad. They wish to keep their money at home now, so the supply of their currency abroad will decrease. And for II, which is only a one-point question, I can simply say that the currency will appreciate. In other words, it will grow stronger relative to other currencies on the foreign exchange market. So this is most likely a three-point question between parts II and I. Okay, let's move on to the final part of this long FRQ. Part E says, given your answer in part DII, which was the currency will appreciate, what will be the effect of the change in the value of country Z's currency on country Z's exports? Now this is also going to be a two-point question because it asks for an explanation. Remember, any time it asks for an explanation, you must give a brief explanation. If an explanation is not asked for, no explanation is needed. All you have to do is indicate. But for this question, we're asked to explain what happens to the exports from country Z following the appreciation of the currency. This should be fairly straightforward. Because the exchange rate increased, this will lead to a decrease in demand for country Z's exports, which will lead to a decrease in country Z's net exports. Again, another thing that will happen is that import spending will increase. If country Z's currency is stronger, then domestic consumers will wish to buy more imported goods and foreign consumers will wish to buy fewer of the country's exports. So the explanation, of course, is that country Z's goods become less attractive to foreign consumers. So exports decrease. So there's the final part of the long FRQ. This FRQ covered several topics from the AP Macroeconomics syllabus. So that's the end of this demonstration of how to succeed on a long free response question. In the next video, we'll go through a couple of short free response questions. That's numbers two and three from the AP free response section.